Hello and welcome to our student question and answer session on the Master of Public Policy. Thank you so much for joining us. We are so grateful to you for making the time um, in everyone's busy schedule to join us today. Um, this is your opportunity to put questions to a wonderful group of students who have very kindly agreed to join us as well. You can go on our website. We have lots of information there, um, www.bsg.ox.ac.uk slash MPP. Um, my name is Helen. I work in the communications um, uh, office here at the school. Um, I'm going to kick off by asking our panellists to introduce themselves and then we'll get started with questions. So I'll ask Jin to introduce and we'll go around the table. Awesome. Thank you, Helen. And thanks everyone for joining. Um, so my name is Jin. Um, I'm from Australia um, and I'm, um, I'm trained as an economist. So before coming here, I've worked, um, I worked at Australia's Central Bank. Um, and prior to that, I also worked um, um, in, in, in the federal government in Australia as well, uh, mainly around economics issues. Um, and on the side as well, one thing I'm really passionate about and something that I've worked uh, um, on in Australia is to improve um, racial diversity um, in the public service um, in Australia as well. So that's just a brief introduction. Thank you. Divya. Thank you so much, Jim. My name is Divya. I'm from London and a dual US-UK citizen. My, I grew up in London and then I moved to the US for school and work. My background is in American electoral politics and most recently I came off of a congressional race in Colorado. Ben. Thank you Divya. Um, hello everybody. My name is Ben Thompson. I'm from the UK. I, my background is in international management. I also studied Spanish on my undergraduate degree and I then moved to Chile and I lived in Chile for the last six years where I worked at the British Embassy in, the, in what was the Department for International Trade, it's now the Department for Business and Trade, before moving into the private sector in Chile, working in international advisory, and later into international philanthropy uh, in Chile, before moving back to come to the school. Perfect. Thank okay. you. Thank Sandra. you, Ben. My name is Sandra. I'm from Ghana. My background is in educational policy. I worked with the United Nations Population Fund in both Ghana, New York, and Kenya before moving here to study. And my passion is just on educational policy and see where we can bridge technical vocational skills training with education and employment. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. You can see then what an amazingly diverse group of people we attract to the school here, and we'll find out a little bit about their motivations. And in fact, one of the first questions I'm going to kick off with is asking everyone what motivated them to apply to the MPP and specifically to here at the school. So, Sandra, I'll pass that one to you. <laughs> Thank you for that question. I would say that one thing that motivated me was definitely the identity of the of Oxford and mm -hmm. also of the school. And interestingly, as much as Oxford is the best, one thing that attracted me was for me, I felt it was easy to get into Oxford than into other institutions. Why? Because they leveled the playing field and ground. Mm -hmm. I was looking at the kind of people they admitted, and I saw that they came from very diverse academic mm -hmm. backgrounds. And I thought that, OK, this is not going to cut me off just because maybe my first degree is in communications, and I'm yet to be exposed to policy. Mm -hmm. So I saw it as a real shot for me. And I'll say that that was one of the main things that motivated me, because my degree wasn't limited. That's really interesting, the level yeah. playing field yeah. aspect of it. That's a fantastic reason to apply. Um, ben, your Thank motivation. You. Um, I think a little bit similar to, to Sandra, I think looking at the school specifically, I think it, is, it has such a focus on the diversity of who can come in because they're looking really to bring in future leaders um, who have the potential to enact change. They're not looking necessarily for technocrats to become more technocratic. Um, or anything like that and so it felt like a place where I could come and I could learn not just from the school but from the people that I would be mm -hmm. with and if you look back on the website at the different um, class pages going back you'll, you'll see the diversity of all the students who have passed through through the school and I think I took the opportunity to apply for an MPP and, and I applied here and to other schools because um, while I had been at the British Embassy, I worked as a locally engaged member of staff at the British Embassy. I wasn't a diplomat. And then I moved into the private sector in philanthropy. And so I had always been policy adjacent. I had never worked on policy. I had never written a policy. I had never worked directly with a politician. Um, but I had always seen the work and the impact that my work had on those outside of my workplace and, and society more at large. And 
as much good as you want to do, there are always so many barriers, there are always so many challenges to overcome. And government, public policy, and you know, public-minded individuals are the ones who really reshape that playing field and reshape those barriers. And so rather than just responding to issues as they arose, um, I hope to come to a place where I could learn how to hopefully stop the issues arising in the first place. That's great. And that's exactly the, the mission of the school is about mm. leadership in public service, good governance and training people mm. and getting the right people in place. And that's hopefully what we're doing here at the, at the school. Um, Divya, your motivation. Yes. So, as I said, I'm from the UK and the, I'm very much in the minority here. Uh, and people come from truly all over the world, from tens of different nationalities um, and just as many countries. And for a lot of people, it's an opportunity to come to visit the UK for often the first time. But for me, it was an opportunity to come back. My work had been in the US and I was getting very focused on US domestic policy, but I didn't want to close that door to being in a more international space. And so my background uh, academically is in more of an international area anyways. And so I wanted to be in a program where that was very international, had a diverse cohort, and um, I could get some sort of policy grounding outside of the US. And this very much offered me that. And I get to see my family more than I used to. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's important. <laughs> that's very important. That ticks all the boxes. Jin? Yeah, so I think one of the big things for me as well is the diversity of school. Um, I really um, appreciate learning from the classmates that we have in, 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 in the school here. And I think that the school really has a focus on um, on ensuring that there is an environment where you can actually learn from that, that diversity that the, that the class gives you. Um, but I guess stepping back a bit, why I want to do an MPP, um, I, as I mentioned before, I was trained as an economist and you know, working in the public service, working in the central bank, I realized that you know, the decisions that we make in, in, in government and in the central bank as well uh, consider a whole broad range of issues. And I wanted a kind of broader perspective to the issues that I was dealing with. Um, and I found that the um, curriculum here gave me that. The, um, in the curriculum um, at BSG, we cover um, things like pol um, the, the politics of policy making, the law aspect of it. Um, and I think having that kind of holistic approach to, to, to public policy is really quite essential. And, I, and that was what I was looking for in, in an MPP and in um, BSG, so MPP in particular. Mm -hmm. That's great. And that's, I think the holistic approach is one is, is the one that is really, really important mm -hmm. because even if you're already working in the public service, you're just working in one perhaps niche area. But here you get the whole overview of, of all the different aspects. So you kind of need to know if you're formulating policy. Mm -hmm. So that's, a, that's great. That's great to know. Um, I was asking before when we were chatting before we started was whether anyone had looked at any other schools of public policy when they had been applying for their MPP. And Ben, I think you have some experience with that. Yes, I, I think most of us do, and most on the school do. Um, and I, I'm British. I was living in Chile. Much like Divya, I wanted to come a little bit closer to home. And so I didn't apply to any of the America, uh, North American schools or anything else in, in Europe or elsewhere. Um, I considered Tsinghua University mm -hmm. at one point, uh, but with everything that's been going on in the world over the last few years, it just felt like the right time to come home. And so I applied here, I applied also to the London School of Economics mm -hmm. for their Master of Public Administration uh, and to UCL for their Master of Public Administration in Public Value and uh, Innovation. And I think whilst they are all, all three of those courses, including this one, are fantastic mm -hmm. degrees and, and I have good friends at all of those schools. Uh, this one, including now, thanks to my amazing colleagues. Um, <laughs> I think what really stood out for me with BSG is what Jin, you were mentioning about kind of the transversality of the curriculum. We do philosophy, we do political mm -hmm. science, we mm -hmm. do law, um, we'll be doing, we've done statistics and we're doing evidence in, in policy making. And what that means is, for me, it's just learning how to make a better decision, who to be talking with, mm -hmm. who to be listening to, when to step up, when to step down, and how we can navigate the world that already exists. I think a lot of the time when people think about policy solutions, people come in with a very genuine hope and desire to do something better, to fix something. But we can't forget that we are coming from a huge history of potential solutions or, or issues that have stopped those solutions from happening. So by being able to take this much more transversal approach, which uh, BSG has been designed to do, 
um, we get to really think better about how to make those solutions. LSE is a fantastic degree, but it's a very technocratic degree mm -hmm. looking at, at the economics of public policy or public administration. That's fantastic. That's brilliant. That's m very much needed. But that, I'm not an economist and I'm, I'm not going to become an economist. That's not my life path. Um, and so this degree offered me something much more suitable mm -hmm. to take those better decisions. It's great that there's so much choice out there mm -hmm. um, exactly. and people have different, you know, it's horses for courses, isn't it? People have different particular policy interests or, as you say, mm -hmm. coming to the school here, it's because that we run the, the course in a very particular way. So um, it's great that people have that. Divya, did you have a comment to make on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we all make the choice to come to Oxford. It's not a second choice for anyone. <laughs> and I think that there's many reasons for that. And for me, I was looking at the US, but I knew that I wanted to be in a more international program. And I was looking at other programs in the UK. I ended up applying to a couple. Um, but one of the things that really stuck with me was I was actually told about this program by somebody who had done this program. Mm -hmm. And the passion and genuine love that that person had for the cohort, for the institution, for the classes that they took and the lessons that they learned was unparalleled when I spoke to other people who had also gone to these other comparable programs. And that really made me want to be a part of this like organization and to really invest in it and to feel like they were the Oxford and BSG was investing in me and in my future as well. And I really feel that that has been the case here. That's so interesting because one of the things we might get time to talk about later is the alumni community here. Mm. And once you join the school as a student, you, you will automatically become part of this huge alumni community. Well, I say huge, we've been running for 10, 11 years now. So we have, oh gosh, 1,500 perhaps um, alumni now across, totally across the globe. And it's a network and a community of um, people who continue to support and help each other through their jobs, provide advice. We have different networks focusing on different policy areas, for example, there's a climate mm -hmm. change group. So people who are working in those fields, still connecting, still helping each other. And that's what's so lovely, I think, about, about the school is that alumni network. And as you say, it's lovely to hear that somebody was that enthusiastic about the school that they, they sort of were able to show you that passion. So um, yeah, you, you have joined a wonderful family of people. So mm -hmm. it doesn't just stop when you graduate um, mm -hmm. at the school. You are yours for life, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, ours for life, I should say. Um, so I'm going to take you back to perhaps this time next year, uh, last year, or perhaps in the summer when you were thinking of applying, or you might have already applied. Mm -hmm. um, the application process itself, it's quite a lot of written work. And anyone who has looked at our website will see all the, um, the different steps that you have to go through when you apply. Um, there's a personal statement where you need to set out your commitment to public service um, to show your kind of leadership qualities. Um, and this year, we're asking for a policy essay, which I, I don't think you probably did. Did, did you do that last yeah. year? I think so we you, had the choice, an essay so, or a memo. Ah, so you might have been yeah. the guinea pigs for that. Um, <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about how you found the application process and, um, you know, the kind of things that you might have highlighted in your application that you thought, you know, were important to, to highlight? Um, and any tips that anyone who is, you know, at the moment sitting on those papers, any tips that somebody might find useful? Um, Jin, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think I found the application process a really good opportunity to just sit down and reflect. Reflect about, you know, what motivates you, what you really find valuable and what you, you, you want to achieve in your career and in your personal life as well. And I think, I think the one tip is take your time on it. Don't, you, uh, uh, if you're tuning in now, you, you'd be very aware of when the deadline is. So I will I'll get started and and, and don't rush it because it's, it's apart from being an application with the opportunity of um, joining the school, it's also a real opportunity to really reflect on, 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 on yourself and what you want to um, bring to the world. Um, I think a couple of things to highlight uh, um, examples of, I guess, when you have been effective and also what you're passionate about. I think the, the, another key thing to highlight as well is what you bring to the cohort. Mm -hmm. um, the admissions mm -hmm. team here is very um, focused on, on creating a cohort that it's, it's really back to the diversity point that really truly reflects the diversity of the world. And I think highlighting what you can bring to that diversity and the, and the conversations um, in the classroom is, is really important. Mm -hmm. That's really helpful. Thank you so much. Divya, how did you find the process? 
Absolutely. So I'm going to go a little bit more on the policy paper side of it. So I know some of us here have policy backgrounds, some of us don't. I personally didn't have as much of a policy background. My background is more political. And so I sort of initially was like, oh, what can I talk about that's, you know, going to really change the game? And I realized that that was the wrong approach for me. And you have a pretty small word limit to talk to explain a policy issue and then provide policy recommendations. And so think about something where you can encapsulate that. Talking about world peace is great and a goal that we should all be working towards, <laughs> but is a little bit hard to put into 800 words. So I wrote about an extremely niche topic of electronic logging devices in long haul trucks. And that allowed me the opportunity to really get into the weeds in these issues and go, I was looking in different Facebook groups and really got stuck into the weeds of that. And I'm really passionate about it. And now, and now that I've had the chance to really look into it, and I think that having something that, is, that you're both passionate about and you can talk about well and explain it to an audience of people who do not have the same background as you is key. And it's clear it doesn't have to be a policy about the health service or, um, you know, something slightly... It can be anything, any mm -hmm. kind of policy and, and, and anything that could have an impact on a society, a community, a person. So I hope that's good advice for you. That is good advice. That's really interesting. It's interesting that you did all that research as well and, and, and sort of doing what you're doing here now. Mm -hmm. Oh, I had a great time. I was, <laughs> I was messaging <laughs> different trucking subunions. <laughs> it, was, it was great. See, applications don't have to be hard. Mm -hmm. They can be fun as well. So <laughs> it's a great example. Thank you. Ben. Amazing. Um, thank you. And I think what Divya just mentioned about it doesn't have to be world peace, you have a short word limit is yes. very worthwhile thinking about. We've just all four of us come from a negotiation workshop this morning where we were listening to people who have negotiated peace deals in Latin America. And we had an hour to talk to them. And as you can imagine, that was not enough. So um, you have to pick your topic well. I also picked a topic that I ended up having to research. I had a lot of fun. My partner is also in the policy sphere. So we made a a couple's evening of it, basically reading papers from the OECD about citizen participation. Um, I think um, the application process in general, um, I would agree with what Jin has said, that uh, try and find a common thread uh, in your career. Uh, um, really, even if you've jumped from space to space, I certainly had, and I never thought that my career was making sense. I kind of just went where the opportunities presented themselves to me. I actually found through this process that I was actually able to find a core set of values about myself which had guided those decisions which I thought had always been a little bit out of my hands. And I was able to then reflect and write my, my application based on that common thread. Um, so it's a very worthwhile um, exercise not just to do a good application but also to then, should you get accepted and good luck to those of you who do choose to apply, you then get here with, with a sense of grounding and confidence that you can then understand why you're here and why you're taking that step. And that's just a really fulfilling sensation to have. Um, on that, though, there's no right answer. There's no one policy issue that will get you in. There's no one way to write about a policy issue mm -hmm. that will get you in. Uh, if you speak to different people who have done different kinds of programs like this, there is a multitude of ways in which you can present the, yourself and your, your vision in a really useful way. Um, two or three very particular points, uh, very concrete. As Jen mentioned, the focus on the cohort and what you bring to the cohort, uh, as far as I understand, this hasn't changed. That it isn't a rolling deadline for applications to this program as there are to other schools. Um, it is a set deadline so that they can then look at all of the applications mm -hmm. and then they, they piece the, the cohort together based on all of the applications. And that's an amazing opportunity to really create a community from, so that when we all get here, um, we are all working and learning from each other. So really understand that you're coming into this not in a competitive environment. The school doesn't grade on a curve. You're not, you're not fighting other people for a, a place um, before the deadline. You're coming to be part of a community. Mm -hmm. So really think about that in your application. Um, your application isn't set in stone. If your interests change when you get hit, mine have. I said that I wanted to achieve one thing by the time I finish, and I think that is changing. That is just part of it. So don't freak out if you think that you have to know in 50 years time what you've done with your career. That's definitely not the case. They're looking for your potential more than your outcome, I think. Um, and get your references on time. I was chasing my references <laughs> to the last day and I was on holiday and it was just the worst, the worst experience. So they are my- They are some very good tips. Sorry. Very good tips and the tips about references because yeah. yes, mm -hmm. you can rely on yourself to finish your application, but if you're having to rely on other people, 
chase or get get those um, requests in very quickly, very soon to your referees. Um, Sandra, how did you find the process? Um, I think I'll just jump on what Ben said, which is about finding that common thread. It's yeah. very important because it helps to keep you consistent. Mm -hmm. um, the application is the only way that the committee is able to see you for who you are. Mm -hmm. So your identity actually needs to show and it needs to be consistent. And I actually appreciate the fact that when you start the process, it looks like it's there. But when you start one step at a time, you realize that, oh, actually, it gives you the opportunity to question the whys and who you are and mm -hmm. why you want to be here. And that is really important. And also, I'd say that when you start the process, don't do it alone. I don't mean don't let allow someone write your essay, of course not, or your policy briefs, but don't do it alone. Like ben was saying he had this lovely chat with his partner on how to go about maybe the policy issues he wanted to write about get you can talk to the alumni as well mm -hmm. just have an insight yeah. as to what to what you want to delve into and write it and have someone also proofread it yeah. mm -hmm. and i felt like this this application gave me an opportunity to own my own personal story i think that academically i've also been challenged before coming here and to be able to put that story on paper and for someone to appreciate it. Because I'm here today because of that story. It shows that I had something to give. Mm -hmm. I had something to offer to the rest of my colleagues here. So do not shy away from the what you consider the little details. They count, they are relevant, own your story to the latter. Mm -hmm. That's what I'll say. That is a great piece of advice. I mean, there are no interviews face to face mm -hmm. to come to the school. Um, it's a written piece of work. So it really has to shine through. Like everyone has been saying, it's your personality, what you bring to the school, because you will be part of a very close-knit cohort. Yep. Um, so getting that, getting that to show in a piece of written work is hard. But, you know, if, as everyone's been saying, you take your time and you think really carefully about your personal story. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that our admissions team, you know, they just love reading all these applications because they are constantly impressed by the, the the kind of applications that we get and then we obviously we get some wonderful students as a result so I'm thank you for that add on sorry to Jim. sandra's point i think sandra raises a really good point and don't you're not in this by yourself um talk to people you know make use of the resources yeah. around you make use of linkedin there are a lot of alumni that would be very happy to to you know talk to you and give you advice um, um so make use of what's around you and the resources out there as well Absolutely. And on the website, there's lots of information. There are blogs giving advice on how to write a particular essay. Um, and our admissions team are always there for, for help and advice too. So um, lots of support out there for you um, to get your applications in. Um, I'm going to move on a little bit. We talked or you talked about leaving your hometowns, leaving your countries to come here. Um, can you talk a little bit about the challenges you might have encountered moving from, you know, far away from family to a town that you might not have been to before? Um, and any tips you might have for people who are sort of considering making that move? Sandra. <laughs> oh, I was hoping the question wouldn't come to me first. <laughs> I mean, do you want to talk about the weather first? Or <laughs> <shall we? laughs> the weather doesn't like me. <laughs> I mean, um, I think that BSG, as in the Blavatnik School, made it very hospitable for us to feel at home mm -hmm. because they realized that we're leaving a lot behind to yeah. come here. Yeah. And also knowing that we're all coming from diverse backgrounds. One, sometimes it could be difficult to fit in and then it could not if the um, opportunities were made available for us to interact. So I'd say that, yes, it's difficult leaving your family behind, but know that you're here to have new experiences. So open up yourself to it. Like, just call someone, have coffee chats. I mean, we've had a couple of that. Mm -hmm. I'm here to do it with a whole lot of other people, but it's helped me build new cultures. Yeah. It's helped me build new relationships mm -hmm. and not always wishing I was back home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I came here to have that experience and I'm going to throw myself at it at my full weight. Yeah. That's, that's great to hear. And it is just a year. Exactly. It goes by so quickly exactly. um, that it's kind of really enjoying every single day. Anyone else want to talk about their experience of moving country? Um, yeah, so I guess I can touch on my experience. Um, so I guess I'm quite privileged in a sense that you know, moving from Australia, the culture is quite similar here. Um, and I have also moved about uh, around Australia for uh, uh, quite a few times. So I'm quite versed with moving, um, uh, moving around. But I, I did find the move to Oxford quite challenging. And I think the, the biggest thing is, is <laughs> I mean, we touched on it, the weather. Um, <laughs> it's, been, uh, it's been a month and a half, or maybe two months of winter. And the sun going down at 3.30 is... Not great. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> we'll work on it. 
<laughs> um, especially, I grew up in Perth, and it's one of the sunniest um, cities in the world. So um, it, it, the sun is, don't underestimate the impact of the sun. But I think ways to deal with that, and what Sandra mentioned as well, is the school community is extremely vibrant. You know, you can really find your home in this community yeah. and engaging as much in the community as possible. Um, you, it's, 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 it's always comforting to know that there is, there is someone within um, the community that, that, you know, is probably feeling the same as you. And, you know, you can go and um, talk bad about the weather. Um, <laughs> um, um, and, yeah, and just being outdoors as much as possible is, uh, when there is sun. Um, when there's sun. sun. Yes, sun. sorry about that. Um, <laughs> any other thoughts about moving? Yeah. As a, as a Brit, you're, <laughs> coming, uh, you're coming home. I'll, I'll speak for both of us and say layers are your best friend. Yes. <laughs> also some fuzzy socks mm -hmm. and some vitamin C. Yep. That is sort of all I have to say on that. And yeah. very sorry. That's, that's <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> the we weather is definitely a, a something that, that binds us all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you mind if I just, Please do, um, Ben, yes. As a, as a Brit, you will also hear, if, if you are from the UK coming, you will hear a lot about the sun, the lack of it, the rain, the lack of flavor in the food. Uh, just, you know, get ready for that. Um, but no, it's, it's great. I think um, my one thing to people who aren't from the UK who are coming, I would definitely say reach out to the alumni or current students if we're here, um, just because the school does a great job in providing information, but there are so many individual personal circumstances um, which obviously cannot be predicted based on everything that's happening in the world, every type of family, every type of individual that comes. And so I would really encourage you to reach out to alumni or current students, because even if we aren't in your own circumstances, perhaps we can speak with our colleagues who have been through something similar. If it's coming with kids, if it's coming with a partner, mm -hmm. if it's uh, coming from a conflict zone, which means you won't be able to go back at any time during your degree and how that will impact you and your mental state and your relationship with your family and your close ones, we can definitely help facilitate those conversations so you take the best informed decision um, and that you then have the time to prepare for those decisions going forward. So that would be my one, um, one uh, piece of advice. And that if you are coming from the UK, I think it's very important to try as best you can to proactively provide those spaces of welcoming and support for, um, for other applicants and other um, students who are chosen to participate in the program so that they can ask those questions mm -hmm. and you can give those answers um, a bit upon and even a little bit before arrival. We had a great uh, colleague from the UK and, and one from Australia who had spent quite a bit of time in the UK who really rallied the cohort even before we got to Oxford and, they, and that then allowed people to answer some of those more logistical or even support-based questions which I think really helped people when they got here. So there's a kind of a shared responsibility there amongst all of you when you're on, the, on your way to Oxford that can make the whole process a little mm -hmm. easier. And it's great to hear that you all actually connect with each other before you get here. Mm -hmm. So you're sort of, you know, already making those connections before you meet face to face. Um, and then once you're here, we have in our programs team some wonderful people who are um, fantastic at providing advice and help should you need any welfare um, support while you're here. And the university, is a, the wider university as well, has, has um, lots of support and advice and help for people um, if, you know, folk feel they are struggling to settle in. But I think, as everyone has said, it's, it's the kind of community of the school that really helps people to, to make that transition quite quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and talking of transitions, when you get here, you spend your first two weeks in induction, mm -hmm. which is a process that really tries to bind everyone together very, very quickly because a year, as we said, is a very short period of time for 146 people to get to know each other and to begin to trust each other because in the classes here, there's a lot of discussion, people have opinions and there are opportunities for, you know, people want to feel there's a safe space to be able to, to um, have those conversations and building trust is really important here um, at the school. So the induction process, I think, goes some way to, to begin to, to, to begin that process. Do you have any thoughts about the induction process? It's, it can be quite a physical process, <laughs> I understand. I haven't taken part in it myself, but um, any thoughts, Divya, on that? Induction is wild. <laughs> <laughs> That's, you know, everyone sort of comes from their backgrounds from every corner of the earth, and sometimes people have landed less than 24 hours before induction starts and you arrive on the first day and I felt the worst imposter syndrome I've ever experienced in my entire life. And then we went into two weeks of activities 
can I give spoilers? Or, well, please go ahead. I mean, that range from sort of rowing to meeting people's partners and families, and it just covers everything in between. And somehow, people are still being social even outside of class, which is mm. a, or an induction, which is absolutely insane. But, you know, I thought one of the things that I really, really appreciated, the thing I most got out of induction was this sense of, we are here to solve big problems and to solve them together. Mm -hmm. We're a community mm -hmm. and everything that they did during that induction was to make us feel like a community during a very short period of time. And that has held up. I mean, we're at the end of our first term and our community feels even closer. There isn't a sense of competitiveness. There's a very strong sense of camaraderie and you start to feel that from the very first day. Mm -hmm. But you're very tired. <laughs> <laughs> That's great to hear. Any other thoughts about induction? I think that was a very um, good summary. <laughs> it was. Yeah. Yeah, ben, I, did you have something? No, I, I had a great time. It's a lot of fun. It's just very intense, yeah. as if you mentioned. Um, I would also say it's probably designed to be intense because mm -hmm. the first term at Oxford is incredibly intense, especially on this program compared yes. to other master's degrees at the university. Mm -hmm. I bumped into a guy at the library the other day who, is on, who has two sessions per week which are each two hours long. And I was like, oh, that's a Tuesday morning for us. <laughs> um, and so it, it, is, it is intense, but it does create these really strong links, which yeah. then give us a great building place to, to go forwards from. Exactly. And it's a lovely experience. Yeah. Well, that's great to hear. That's lovely to hear. I shall pass that on to our team <laughs> who, put the, uh, who put the induction program together. Um, so once you're here, you've done your induction. We have... Um, some of the people who a lot of our students actually have got here because they're lucky enough to get funding um, and have scholarships. Um, we have 90% this year who are on full or partial scholarships. Um, and I know some of you have scholarships. Have you got any um, tips or any suggestions for what people should do when they're looking for scholarships? So, and, you know, the kind of research that you might do, the kind of scholarships that you might go for, um, what you should be looking out for, and the process itself. Um, Jen, I know that you have a scholarship think from the bank. Yeah, yeah. so um, I think my experience might be slightly different, but I guess I can give some tips on, I guess, how I thought about the funding process. Um, so I am funded by, by my employer, and, um, and I guess I went through a competitive process to get that funding. But during the competitive process, and I think there's something that's really important to think about is keep your options open. So look around um, and see what scholarships uh, are available in your country and available to you as an individual and plan out deadlines and, mm -hmm. and make sure things are sequenced and that um, you, you always have a contingency plan um, 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 if, if anything falls through. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the school also has a bunch of scholarships that um, if, if, you, if you are fortunate to get, a, to, to get an offer to school, the school will open up um, um, those options to you as well. So um, funding is, is stressful, but um, um, there are a lot of options um, yeah. out there to explore. Yeah, lots of options. And Sandra, I think you are with AFOX. You're a yes. lovely mm. partner of the school. Yes, I think for me, it was very interesting when I got on AFOX, but I appreciated it because... First of all, like Jean was saying, once you get admission, mm -hmm. the school, the department makes it possible mm -hmm. to, for you to get funding because mm -hmm. you already know how intense mm -hmm. and how maybe expensive the course, the program is. Yeah. So I was just happy to know that um, I was nominated for that. I had my interview and then I got in. So there was, they already gave you that leverage yes. by making these options available to you. So yeah. aside the fact that you are looking for funding on your own, which you should, yes. just also know that the school also has your interest at heart and they're actually nominated. So I just got these weekly emails that kept updating me that, okay, we nominated you for this scholarship. We nominated you. We are hoping That's that you right. get the best of results. And I feel like I felt so privileged because I was like these people actually have my best interest yeah. at heart and those weekly emails just kept me going That's right. so please do look for other options but know that once you get into the school the school has your best interest at heart look at the department website definitely there are a list of scholarships that are awarded for the MPP yeah. look where you fall some are based on countries you're coming from some are based on the program itself and some other um, criteria that is used just see where you fall in and just keep looking till either the school reaches out or you find your own scholarship. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, that's really good to know. Any other thoughts on that, on funding? I mean, it's, it's a process sure. everyone has to go through if they're, um, if they're not self-funding. Um, but as Sandra has said, we do hope to make the process you know, to help people along and support them as they're looking for funding. You know, it's our, in our interest to get the best possible students coming to the school. So anything we can do to help, then we do. Um, we want to make sure that, that finances are never a barrier to coming here. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, yeah, so if you're looking for scholarships, do look on our fees and funding page on the website. Sure. Um, should we talk a bit about the course itself? So we have 146 students this year. It's a big class. Mm -hmm. um, do you get any kind of personal attention from faculty? You have supervisors, um, so you have that kind of support for as, as through the year with your work. Mm -hmm. How does that how does that work out for you? That sort of personal attention in quite a big class. Mm -hmm. Jin, do you want to say a few words? Up? Yeah, I can um, start off. Um, so, uh, as part of the way that this course is structured, you would have a academic supervisor that you meet. Um, at least twice a semester, and um, they're also very open to me more often as well. So that's one avenue where you can have quite a bit of personal interaction with you know, an academic that has probably done quite similar work to you um, and are interested in quite a uh, similar space um, as you are. I believe that the school pays a lot of attention in matching supervisors to your interests and your, um, uh, your, your field of work as well. Um, apart from that, the, 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 the seminar discussions that we have are in quite small classes. Um, for our political philosophy and our economics classes this semester, we've had seven people in the room, um, uh, seven students in the room to, to one supervisor, which is um, coming, coming from the education system in Australia. Um, it's quite small. Maybe someone else on the panel might have a different experience. Um, and also um, the lecturers and the the, the the, the professors facilitating classes are extremely accessible. You know, yeah. mm -hmm. this building, um, you've seen pictures of the building, it's extremely beautiful. It's also actually quite small, you know, mm -hmm. you, you bump into them um, in the corridors and they're always very happy to have a one-on-one -on -one with you to, to discuss class content or just to discuss life or philosophy mm -hmm. or whatever you really want. So there is, uh, there is a real passion among the, 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 the teachers that we have here um, and, and they're very accessible. It's interesting you say that the school feels very small because yeah. yes, it is a it's a beautiful building and do please have a look on our website if you haven't already seen pictures of it, um, and it, it might look a little bit intimidating as you walk up to it, but when you get inside there is a real warmth to it, um, and yes, you can bump into anyone walking down the down the corridor. Um, how about the workload, Divya? The workload at the school? Do you have any? I mean, is it quite intense in the first term, and do you have any tips for how mm. to manage that? that workload? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm actually just going to step back and talk about the last question. Please do, yes, of course. Because I think there's so much at the school that is part of what makes BSG quite unique. The school offers mentorship opportunities mm -hmm. for you um, with people who specialize beyond the supervisors. These are people who are practical. You know, they work out in the sort of like professional spaces that you're interested in. Um, additionally, the school is extremely receptive to the faculty who are extremely receptive to feedback mm -hmm. um, and are very personally invested. So if you come to them with a policy topic or an area of interest that you have, they will work with you to make sure that that is incorporated in however you can you work together to decide is best. So whether that's working on case studies or having, you know, that sort of discussions or bringing in speakers, the school is extremely receptive to that, which I think is very unusual for um, a large institution. And also one of the really great things is, which I mean, I guess this sort of goes into the point of the workload, you want to stay after class to continue the discussions. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just had a an optional class that over a hundred students came to and we sort of stepped out to, to be here, but those conversations were very much continuing okay. for half an hour after the class had ended. And that's the sort of environment and the sort of academic environment that is fostered here. Mm -hmm. It's not a super academic program. That's not what the point of this program mm -hmm. is. It's a professional program. It's a generalist program. But, um, and so they're not going to overwhelm you with work. You're gonna spend a lot of time in class, much more so than you would spend at other programs and other master's programs in general, as Ben mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, but the workload is, is quite manageable, especially when you come from a professional setting uh, as well. And it's really so that 
there is the structure for you to then meet with other members of the cohort and meet with the faculty and other people involved in the administration to discuss the topics that you're either learning about or that you are the expert in. Mm -hmm. That's really helpful. Do you sure. have anyone have any thoughts yeah, on do you that? Mind if I no, please do. Um, I think coming into the conversations that Divya has mentioned with with faculty. And, and Jin mentioned it as well. Uh, it definitely feels like the faculty, especially in, in the larger classes, um, beyond being experts in their topics, which they are, and we, we do have access to, to incredible experts, not just from an academic level, but also from policy experience, which is fantastic. It, the main course conveners act more as facilitators, and they really build on the expertise of the cohort. They recognize the experience that's coming into this cohort and into this program. Um, I know that for our economics class, Jin was invited to speak about his experience <laughs> in central banking. Um, and that happened across uh, various different weeks when we were touching on various different uh, topics. And so in that regard, in terms of the personal um, attention we get uh, mm -hmm. from the faculty, we get that on a personal level, but we also get that on a level in which we can contribute back to the learning experience of our colleagues. Um, in terms of uh, workload, um, yes, it is. We have a lot more contact time than other degrees. Mm -hmm. The reading lists, I think, are a little bit shorter as a result, but they are still very intense because we have so many contact hours and we have to prepare quite a lot. Um, I think the most difficult part of this degree is just the wealth of choice of things that you could be doing. The school itself organizes beyond your main curriculum so many things. You then have the entire University of Oxford and everything that's going on there. You also have things going on in London. It's, a, it's less than an hour on the train. Uh, you then have a social life. You have a personal life. And so trying to find that balance mm -hmm. is tough. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I, don't wanna, I, like, I think we've all struggled yeah. to a certain extent working out where to put our focus and where to put our energy. And that's just something that I think people should reflect on and think about before or in their process to getting to the school. Uh, I think I came in naively expecting to be, do, uh, expecting to be able to do everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've had to come to terms with that. Um, and you know, there are weeks when you're down, but the best thing is everyone's going through that and mm -hmm. the support network within the school amongst the cohort is great. We have the wellbeing staff who are amazing as well. And I would also um, highlight uh, you're all, everyone who gets accepted into the university is a member of a college mm -hmm. um, and you also get a college supervisor. And most of the time the college supervisors because uh, postgraduate students aren't academically engaged with their college that much, the college supervisors tend to be on a more well-being, welfare level. Um, we just did a graduate reporting for the first term here at the university. I mentioned that I was a little bit worried. I was feeling a bit worn out from the workload trying to get everything together. And literally the next day, my college advisor emailed me to set up a meeting this week so that we could discuss that and work out um, strategies going into the next term mm -hmm. in January. So I don't say that to freak anybody out. I just say that because it is, it is a factor, but there are structures and there are people around you to make sure that you can deal with that. And having too much to do and too many amazing things to do is really a great problem to have. <laughs> so. It's great to hear that you have that, yeah. that yeah. structure. Yeah. And I'm going to come on to the college system as well, yeah. um, because that's something that, that somebody has, has had questions about. But Sandra, do you have any thoughts on... Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So with a course, you don't really need to have prior experience in any of the programme before coming here. Mm -hmm. And I think that is also factored into the structure of the course. So take economics, for example, we have the interactive class and then we have the experience class. So that's so for the interactive session, if you haven't had any prior knowledge in economics, mm -hmm. it's designed for you. And for those in the experience stream who have had that, it's also designed for you. So don't feel intimidated. Mm -hmm. I mean, it works out in the end. With the workload, I agree with Ben, sometimes it can be a bit challenging when you have to um, juggle all these other aspects of mm -hmm. you being here for just one year. But one thing that helped with the workload is study groups. So so there were groups that have there are groups that have been set up and we delegate the reading. So you don't one person doesn't need to do all the readings, right. further readings, you just need to create the summaries yeah. and then you share. And that's how we get it to move along considering the workload. And also know that there are experts here. Like Jen, <coughs> he is an expert in economics. So when you find it challenging, you could just pull it's him okay. aside and ask him some <laughs> exactly. There are people who have experiences in philosophy. Right. So for some of us who are new to philosophy, it could be a bit overwhelming with all these concepts so it was great to have people who had prior knowledge ready to you know impact that knowledge into you it just helped and also one thing that 
really, really stood out for me was informative. I mm -hmm. appreciated the fact that it didn't immediately, it's not counting mm -hmm. to uh, your final assessment. It sort of gives you time to just sit back, answer the questions, get feedback mm -hmm. on that, so that it gives you, it gives the opportunity to prepare properly yeah. mm -hmm. for towards your summative, which yeah. is what counts. So the formative helps because coming back from certain previous academic, you know, it's counting from the word go. Whatever I'm making in class, if I make a zero, <laughs> it's going to count to my final assessment. And that right. can be very intimidating. Yeah. So, so the I, formatives really help Exactly, you. it helps. Yeah, it that's helps. really good to know. That's helpful. Um, talking about policy and all the different um, areas that you're looking at in these, in these classes. And Ben, you mentioned that when you started to think about applying, you had in mind a particular area that you were interested in, and that has changed. How much scope does the degree provide for you to explore your own policy interests? Um, is, there, is there much opportunity to really focus in on, say, trucking for Divya? Um, but is there, do you get that kind of opportunity if there's a particular policy interest that you want to explore further? I'll open that up. I think that's a, that's a really good question, um, especially if you have a uh, very niche policy interest, right. like maybe trucking. Um, <laughs> uh, one of my niche policy interests is uh, traffic management and infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure is not that niche, but anyway. Um, I think uh, the school is full of experts in a whole bunch of random fields and uh, related to public policy, of course. Um, and, um, and, and everyone in the school is very happy to, to, to meet with you to discuss it. So I think there is a, a, a broad network that you, can, that you can access as being part of the school. So you, you might not find what you want um, in, if you have a niche policy interest in, 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 in the academic content, um, but you, you'll find an expert in the school. And even if you don't find an expert in the school, you, you'll find it. I guarantee you, somewhere in Oxford. Yeah. Um, so there are all these opportunities outside the classroom mm -hmm. to really explore as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's traffic management. <laughs> That's interesting. You can team up. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you can team up, exactly. <laughs> traffic management for truckers. Um, anyone else have some thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. So I think um, we're all doers here. If something doesn't <laughs> exist, you can just make a group <laughs> yeah. and you can find other people who have similar interests to you because there will be other people in the cohort who will have at least overlapping areas of interest with you. And you can bring in speakers, you can learn, have the people within the cohort come and speak. And we have so many members of the cohort who speak at all different events and everyone, so many people show up um, because we all care about learning about different things and especially areas where we maybe don't know as much. Um, additionally, I think one thing that Jen said that I really want to emphasize is there is so much happening outside of BSG yeah. and especially in terms of talks and really, as Ben said, there is choice upon choice upon choice here and if there is a really niche policy issue that you're interested in, even if the School of Government isn't doing a talk on that specific thing, I guarantee that there will be at least one or two lectures that are happening a term, if not more often, on that specific issue. I mean, there are hundreds of talks that happen at Oxford every single week. So I really wouldn't be concerned about not finding other people who are interested in your interest. That's good to know. Anyone have another thought on that, Sandra? Um, I think... Also in a Trinity term, I realized that you have the opportunity to tailor your learning to some key policy issues. Mm -hmm. And that's a great starting, well, not starting point, but also to continue to find in where your interest aligns. Also, it's also a great place to start. And um, yeah, and just to jump on to Jin, just look outside Oxford. Aside that, there are so many societies, so many mm -hmm. clubs, so yeah. many mm -hmm. associations you could join in that shares the same policy interest as you. So mm -hmm. um, as... So move, move, move out of the BSG and also find your place. Yeah, yes. that's what I'll say. That's, that's good advice. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, Ben. Three fun things. Building on the kind of, what, what Divya, you mentioned about um, if you find it, you can make a group. We literally have yeah. dozens of WhatsApp groups on every <laughs> possible issue, um, which are great. But there is, there is a story there about being self-motivating. Mm -hmm. And I think if you see that there's something missing, if you see that something isn't happening, you can make it happen. Or if the, you have a level of expertise that you want to share, 
Um, you can organize your own event. You can work with the facilities yeah. and the events team here at the school to book a space out, a lecture theater, a working room, anything. And you can put something on together. You can get AV support and everything like that. Um, and so share that. And people want to listen to that. Um, and, and your colleagues from, from the cohort will will attend, will ask you questions, and you'll stimulate some of the most amazing conversations from, from putting yourself out there. And I know that's quite scary at times, but this is such a welcoming and, and engaged and curious environment that um, you know all of the student-led events that I've been to have been really well attended by a whole range of people. And often people you think wouldn't have been interested in that topic. Uh, you know, yeah. Don't judge a book by, by its cover mm -hmm. or that. Uh, you can also build your, your own interests into the core curriculum to a certain extent um, with the formative essays, for example, that, Sandra, you were mentioning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I've lived in Chile for the last six years. There's a whole constitutional process going on in Chile. Mm -hmm. So I had an essay question that was about um, whether or not democratic elections are required for government legitimacy. And I ended up using the case study of Chile's constitution okay. as, as the, the anchor of my essay to bring in that theoretical uh, framework that we had developed in our classes and in our seminars. So I then deepened my interest and knowledge on constitutional politics thanks to the philosophy module that yeah. we had. And so my point there is the curriculum is designed, I, I, from what I believe and what I've uh, experienced so far, to really develop those transversal skills of understanding why we do what we do, how we do what we do, and then it's so that you can then take that and apply that mm -hmm. to your policy interest areas. So if, you're, if you want to come here to be a specialist in infrastructure or, or traffic management, this may not be that kind of school, but it may be the school that can give you the tools and the skills to go back into that area afterwards mm -hmm. and really make a difference yeah, in it. And then let's work. Yeah, exactly. And I think also it's very interesting, just that word that you used, Ben, curiosity. Mm -hmm. is, is everyone coming to the school is incredibly curious, and that's what's so kind of beautiful about what the school does, is it encourages people's curiosity to, to look beyond their own particular niche area um, and their own country. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what's, what's incredibly important about the school. Um, I'll just go back, because we've had a question <laughs> about um, colleges, so college life. Um, the college system, it's, it can be quite alien to most of us who didn't go to Oxford or Cambridge or any of these <laughs> universities. Once you join the school, you become a member of a college um, where you live, basically. But how do you choose that? Um, can you give us your impressions of how that kind of process worked and what it's like living in a college? I'm, I'm, happy to, yes. I'm happy to start, and this might be going a little bit a bit against the grain of the traditional way that you think of um, Oxbridge colleges, but for the majority of people at BSG, BSG is your main community. That yeah. is very different from most other programs here mm -hmm. at Oxford. And so all of that is to say colleges can be very stressful to look at and you go, oh my gosh, there's... 30 something of them, what on earth am I going to apply to? Don't worry, it's not going to impact whether or not you're accepted into the school mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. just take some of the pressure off of that aspect of it because no matter what college you're part of, they all have great things going on and um, you're part of BSG, which is a really tight knit community. And you also have access to visiting other colleges through the people in the cohort. You mm -hmm. can go to other colleges for formal dinners. You can go to other colleges to hang out. You can bring people to your own college. And so just of all of the many things in the application to stress about, I would say use the colleges as a time to sort of stalk places on Google Maps <laughs> rather than putting a lot of um, pressure onto mm -hmm. yourself on that aspect of it. That's really helpful. Thank you. I may just make an additional point in terms of um, accommodation and living um, situations here in Oxford. Um, most of the colleges provide accommodation for undergraduate students, but very few um, provide um, accommodation for all of their postgraduates. At times, none of their postgraduates have designated accommodation. And so if uh, that is an issue, if you're bringing a family, if you are having those considerations, um, there is perhaps um, logic to looking at the different colleges, mm -hmm. seeing which those that do have uh, more support for postgraduates or for families who are coming to study with you or, or will come with you when you study. Um, but I, I would fully agree with, with, with you, Divya. I, I think that um, if you have a very specific experience that you want to get from this, you may want to pick a particular college. Yeah. But 
there's no guarantee you'll get selected into that college. You can put a preference, but but the colleges will pick who they want to pick. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I didn't pick a college on, on mine. I, I didn't have the time to really go through the list of 38, analyze them one by one, which is better. Um, and I knew that coming to BSG was, was my goal. It wasn't coming to a particular college. Mm -hmm. I got put into a smaller college. Um, I've had a great time there with the events I do go to, with the people I have met. Um, and it's still a, a lovely part of my Oxford experience. Um, so I haven't missed out on anything I feel from that. Um, and yeah, we have 140 plus members of the school on the cohort. <clears throat> and um, and you can pretty much get anywhere through those people. Yeah. So yeah, it's great. What's your experience, Sandra? I think for the college, it's just to create like a double safety net, just mm. to mm -hmm. for you to know that you are still not alone, yes. aside yes. you being in the school. Because for me, I'm in St. Anthony's, and we are like 19 uh, yeah. on the program, <laughs> and we're gin. Yeah. So, uh, nice. so afterwards, we still have that community where we meet at formals, or we just meet together to right. hang out, or do one thing or the other. And also, there you still have like an academic advisor. So mm -hmm. even beyond mm -hmm. BSG, you still have someone you can talk to right. about maybe your academic challenge or whatever it yeah. is you're going through. So the college system, I've come to understand, is just for you to know that you're in safe hands. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. a lot of support, which it's is a lovely, lot of and with the school, yeah. which is yeah. great. I've just realised that we are actually coming to the end of the session, which is we could just keep on chatting. Well, I could just keep on chatting. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to do is ask all four of you just to offer um, one piece of advice to people who are watching us. Um, to those people who are thinking of applying, what one piece of advice would you give them? Who would like to start on that one? I'm going to go for I'll you, just, Sandra. I'll just <laughs> go. I'll say that if you're considering coming here, then that means you have the potential to get in. Mm. And do not give up on that dream. This wasn't the first time I applied. I actually applied four years ago, oh, okay. and I didn't get in. But today I'm here. So I just want to say, if this is your dream, push for it until you get in and ask for help. You don't need to do it alone. Thank you. That's lovely. Thank you, Sandra. Who wants to go next? Jen. Um, OK, I think um, the one piece of advice I would give, and it's something that I mentioned previously, is talk to people. Look around you and find people who have um, um, thought about a similar story uh, and a similar journey and, um, and, and chat to them about their, their own journey. And also talk to people who have done the program before. Um, LinkedIn is a great resource mm -hmm. there, and um, there are many people that would be very willing to have a conversation with you about yeah. that. Our alumni are wonderful. They are so helpful in um, offering advice to, to prospective students. So do that's great advice from Jen to look on LinkedIn. Divya. Yes, so there's, there's so much that, that I think we could all say here. What I would say is people coming from all sorts of backgrounds, backgrounds that we can't even begin to imagine as you're sitting and writing your application right now, but so long as you're earnest, you're empathetic, and you're ready and willing to learn, and make that is what is most important. And mm -hmm. if Oxford and if BSG can see that, then that is going to be your strongest application. Mm -hmm. Perfect, thank you. Ben. Yeah, no, I think um, building on what everyone said, you know, the diversity of this cohort, and it sounds cliche, and I didn't believe it until I got here, and that sounds even more cliche. But, um, but genuinely, what I have learned, whilst I'm very grateful for the incredible faculty and the resources that the school gives us and the access to uh, literature and knowledge that is unparalleled is a dream come true, what I have learned most is from the empathy and the earnestness and the vulnerability of my of my um, colleagues on, on the cohort. And so truly a anybody from any background can get here if you can if you can do a good application, if you can show why you should be here. Um, many people would be thinking about imposter syndrome, whether or not you belong here. And I will tell you that everyone suffers imposter syndrome, but then you'll say, oh, no, but I have the strongest imposter syndrome, <laughs> which I think all of us have done. Um, but genuinely, be confident in the decision you're mm -hmm. taking to apply here. Uh, be confident in the decision to, to come here. It's tough. There are up days, there are down days. There are times when you're questioning yourself. I have had that entire roller coaster. I think people have seen me have that roller coaster. But right now, we've just finished, or we are, we're in the last of the, 
second week of additional weeks from the main term. <laughs> it's been 12 weeks altogether. I am exhausted, yeah. <laughs> but I've never been happier. And I truly feel like I made the right decision and I belong here. Um, and that's thanks to the people around us on the cohort. So you can do it. Well, that's great. That's lovely. That's a lovely way to end. Um, I know everyone is looking forward to a break over Christmas, <laughs> but I hope that's given you a real flavour of what it's like here at the school. It is a community. That's what's so lovely about the school is you suddenly have, you know, 146 best friends who you will continue to have contact with um, for the rest of your lives. But it's also about your curiosity and when you come to the school, what you're prepared to do to kind of soak in all this knowledge and learnings and how you can then apply it when you move on to do wonderful things in the public sector, hopefully. Um, I'm sorry that we haven't got around to all your questions. I hope this has been a really useful session for you. Like I said, there will be a recording on YouTube um, shortly uh, that you will be able to look at again. Do look at the website. Um, our admissions team as well are there to help you should you have any questions. But thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Um, and we hope that we'll see you in 2024. Yeah. So, yeah, take care. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank Good you. Luck. Bye. <laughs>